Well, hello. My name is Thomas Madry. I am ASMP's General Counsel and Head of National Content Education, and this is Episode 2 of Focus on the Law, one of the four shows uh, that you can find over at the ASMP Academy. And today, we're going to dig into a really interesting case and one that is very timely and topical because it was just argued in front of the United States Supreme Court. ASMP is right in the middle of it, as you're going to see. And of course, what we're going to do towards the end of the day is answer some quick hit legal FAQ questions. That's the format here. We're just going to jump in and get started. I'm super excited. Let's get after it. So, one thing I want you to think about when we're talking about the law is that these cases ha take forever, right? And they go to different levels. So, any court case starts at the district court level. Now, we're talking about federal court cases, right? Because almost all the cases that are copyright in nature, which are a lot of the things that visual creators deal with, are federal cases because they all fall under copyright law. Now, if you're interested in learning a lot about copyright law, you can check out the core copyright curriculum over at the ASMP Academy where I go into copyright essentials and we talk about the history of copyright and the Copyright Act. But today we're not going to get into any of that. What we're going to talk about is this case. It's called Unicolors versus H&M. And throughout the day, I'm just going to be calling it Unicolors, right? And Unicolors is a brilliantly interesting case that uh, is very important for all creators. So what I want to do is start with what the case is about. And many of the cases that get to the U.S. Supreme Court are very what we might call technical, right? And when I say technical, what I'm what I'm really saying is they're not being decided on, you know, is this copyright infringement? Is this considered publication? What they're being decided on is interpreting the laws, interpreting the technicalities that go into into the laws. So Supreme Court cases can sometimes be really dense. And this is kind of a dense case. What the Supreme Court was, was answering is essentially this. What are the standards for deciding whether a misstatement in an application for registering a copyrighted work is sufficiently serious to require a court hearing and refer the matter to the Copyright Office under this section of the Copyright Act called 411B? That was a uh, that's a lot of words to say uh, to say something that's relatively simple. And that is when you're filling out your copyright application, when you're filling out that copyright application, if you make a mistake, is that mistake knowing? Are you committing fraud on the copyright office? What if the mistake is based on not understanding the law? Is that different than a mistake based on not understanding the facts of what you're saying? Or do you think you're doing the right thing and then it turns out that you're not doing the right thing? You checked the wrong box. And what does that mean? So that's kind of the gist of this case. Now, you're going to hear me talk about this thing called oral arguments. And when we get to the U.S. Supreme Court, what we're really saying is, hey, um, U.S. Supreme Court, we want you to hear this case. So the first thing you do is you write a brief. Each side writes a brief which lays out in words and writing the arguments and the reasons why the Supreme Court should find in their favor. After the brief is submitted to the Supreme Court, the case is set for oral arguments. And oral arguments are where the, the lawyers have a certain period of time to present their case to the court, and the justices then ask questions. And it's a little bit of a free-for-all, right? 
the lawyers get up there with this prepared statement and they want to say they want to get all their points in and then they might be two minutes in and one of the justices might interrupt them and say oh wait a second give me a little more clarity on this or here's my question related to what you just said it's kind of fun to listen to uh, if you're into the legal side of these things and the u.s supreme court doesn't allow video but they have live audio so you can listen to these oral arguments as they're going on the justices then after oral arguments will take the briefs and take the their interpretation of what the answers were from the lawyers and what the lawyers uh, presented to them and they'll have a conference and then they'll vote and depending which way the vote comes out a justice is assigned to write the opinion and the opinion is like the official last word on the matter so where are we in this case where are we in unicolors well on november 8th so 11 days ago 10 days ago the court heard oral arguments in this case but before we talk about the specifics of this case, I want to talk about what ASMP did in this case. ASMP writes amicus briefs, and it's one of the, the things that I enjoy doing uh, the most in, in this position. And what are amicus briefs? Well, amicus briefs are, are friend of the court briefs is kind of how, how they're known. And when ASMP comes in, we're not the primary attorney for any party. What we're doing is we're saying to uh, we're saying to the court, hey, your decision is going to affect creators, is going to affect photographers, is going to affect copyright owners in a certain way. And we want you, court, to understand what this is, right? And so we write often in support of one of the parties but we aren't one of the parties to the case. Now, uh, I've been uh, uh, lucky enough to be able to write a number of briefs for the US Supreme Court in my role here at ASMP. And this brief, uh, I was the primary author on. And when we write a brief like this, there are many groups who want to sign on to the brief. And so what we're, what we're really talking about here is that the groups will look at the brief and support the brief and say, yeah, these are the arguments that we support as well. And this brief for Unicolors had a total of 14 groups. Of course, there was ASMP, uh, but we also had the California Society of Entertainment Lawyers, APA, the Artist Rights Society, ASCRO, the Association of Medical Illustrators, Center for Art Law, Digital Justice Foundation, Digital Media Licensing Association, Graphics Artists Guild, and PPA, PPA, and the Texas Accountants and Lawyers for the Arts. So all these groups looked at the brief, said, yeah, we support this, we wanna sign on to that. And that makes the brief stronger because then the court sees, look, this affects all of these different groups and it makes a difference, right? And so we hope that when the justices go back and they're in conference and they're thinking about this case, they read the brief and they understand how their decisions will affect, will affect photographers, right? Will affect creators. And you'll notice not all of the groups that signed on are uh, photography related. We have graphic artists, we have illustrators, uh, we have the Digital Justice Foundation, which is a great advocate of copyright protection. And so, uh, this brief had wide support and we were able to submit it to the justices. If you want to read this brief, uh, there will be a link on the page uh, uh, with, this, uh, with this video over at the ASMP Academy. Uh, you can also go to ASMP and type in unicolors in the search box and you will find a copy of our brief as well. So let me just pull a few quotes from the brief that we wrote. Um, and this, these quotes are some of the ones that I think are the most important and some of the ones that when I was writing this brief, I wanted to lay out what the core issues were. So I started with the creative fabric of society is woven by photographers, illustrators, graphic designers, 2D and 3D artists, and so many others 
whose livelihoods depend on the protections afforded them by the Constitution and the Copyright Act. And gosh, I really believe this is true, right? This is what ASMP fights for. You know, there's such a vibrant community of creators in the world, and it, from artists, uh, fine artists, to commercial photographers, to graphic uh, artists and illustrators, all of these groups uh, create such important pieces of society. I went on, for these artists and authors, navigating the complex legal process for registration of their copyrights is daunting. Photographers, illustrators, designers, 2D and 3D artists, and all other manner of individual copyright owners occasionally will, despite their best efforts, submit a good faith registration with an error unknown to them, often based on a point of law which itself is subject to continually shifting jurisprudence and academic opinion. Now, really, what am I saying there? I'm saying, look, you can try uh, to fill out a copyright registration if you are one of if you are one of these creators and you think that you really nailed it and everything you wrote on there is true and accurate, but it turns out you are interpreting this piece of law in a way that the copyright office doesn't agree with. And so then should the remedy be to just throw out the whole application and say you did it wrong and you know, you're know you committing fraud because you signed your name to something that was incorrect? Obviously we think no, right? Obviously we think that is not the way to go. The other part is that these areas of law are very unsettled. You know, if you ask 10 different attorneys, uh, 10 different copyright attorneys, what the definition of publication is, you're going to get a lot of different answers if a work is, quote, published or not published. So I went on to talk about the publication status. And I said, no question more aptly illustrates this untenable balance than that of publication status. As organizations who work with small creators, one of the most questions of Amiki by its members is, has my work been published? The answer to this five-word query divides, can divide and vex experienced copyright practitioners as well as the most qualified copyright scholars. To strip an author of her protection based on a good faith error regarding publication status, especially when that error confers no additional benefit to the applicant, strikes at the heart of the purpose of copyright law. And I couldn't, I couldn't feel more strongly about this. People should not be worried that they are going to lose copyright protection because they check the wrong box on an application. That defeats everything that the Copyright Act is designed to do. But enough about ASMP. I want to talk about this case and the oral arguments in this case. So I'm going to go through a lot of quotes and a lot of things that went on. Uh, you can download this presentation so you can read it more closely. I'm, I'm not going to read every quote word for word, uh, but I do want you to be thinking about who's involved and what they're saying. So there's really uh, uh, three lawyers that presented to the court, and then, of course, we have the Supreme Court justices. Um, the first lawyer uh, is, is a lawyer, and I'm just going to call them by their last names uh, so we are... Uh, or consistent all the way through, is Unicolor's attorney, uh, Rosencrantz. And he is the first one up. And we're going to talk about the procedure that the lawyers take when they're in front of the Supreme Court. Next up was an attorney who was representing the United States, because the United States came in on this case, and the United States said, this is an important matter. The Copyright Office thinks this is an important matter. And so they did something that they don't always do, which is they sent a lawyer to talk to the Supreme Court about why this matter is so important. And then finally, we have Attorney Stris. And uh, he is from, uh, uh, and he represents H&M. And so, as I mentioned, Getting the U.S. attorney in there is, is a pretty big deal. The getting an attorney from the Solicitor's General Office, which is uh, what we call the lawyers who represent uh, the United States in front of the Supreme Court, um, because they're, they're representing the Copyright Office as well. And they came in at the last minute and said to Unicolors, hey, 
we are going to argue in support of many of, of the arguments that you make. So what's the order when there is a Supreme Court opinion or a Supreme Court set of oral arguments? Well, first, Unicolors presents its argument and fields questions from the panel of justices. Next, the government presents its argument and fields questions. H&M then uh, presents its argument and fields questions. And then the last word goes back to Unicolors as the petitioner, meaning the person who, who petitioned to bring this case, to have the ruling overturned uh, that was in the lower courts, right? Because again, this moved up through the ranks and Unicolors had a decision uh, that was adverse to its position. And so it went to the Supreme Court and said, you should hear this and then reverse what the lower court did. Unicolors gets the rebuttal, which is the last word of the arguments. Now, how did it all go? So it is, we don't know the result of this yet, right? We don't know what the result is. But what we do know is that listening to the questions that the justices ask of each of the attorneys can kind of guide us sometimes to understanding how they're looking at this case and how they're looking at this matter. But I will caution you, it is often that you will think after oral arguments, hey, things are going one way, and it turns out things, are, things went a totally different way when the opinion uh, comes out. So I don't want you to put a ton of stock into the questions, except to say, I think that the questions shaded in a way that the justices were supporting unicolors, right? Supporting the group that ASMP and all the different creators groups supported. And uh, I felt positive after hearing these oral arguments, and we're gonna look at some of the reasons why. Now, again, when the opinion comes out, uh, it may be not in unicolors favor, and we'll go back and look at what the reasoning was for that. So first up, was Unicolors. And uh, Unicolors attorney talked about what the question here is. What are we really here to talk about? And Unicolors attorney said, the question here is what state of mind a copyright infringer must prove to establish that an applicant included inaccurate information with knowledge that it was inaccurate. And that quote, with knowledge that it was inaccurate, comes from the statute, comes from the different laws and regulations related to copyright registrations. And then the lawyer for Unicolors went on and said, that's the question and here's the answer. The answer is that it requires subjective awareness of the inaccuracy itself. And then there's some legal reasons that, uh, that he goes into. He says the same standard applies whether the inaccuracy was because the applicant misunderstood the law or misunderstood the facts or even did something like include a typo. Simply put, if you don't know that information is inaccurate, if you honestly believe it to be accurate, then things sh you shouldn't have your application kicked out. Now, when uh, let, me, let me just take a step back and say, on all of these next few uh, slides that we're looking at, these are quotes from the attorneys. Uh, these are actually what the attorneys said in the oral arguments. So Unicolor's attorney went on to talk about the history, because when you argue in front of the Supreme Court, they really care a lot about what Congress intended and what their prior history is, right? And so he said, no court in a century has invalidated a copyright registration based upon an innocent legal error. And there are a lot of dangers that are associated with this. He said, the Ninth Circuit rule will wreak havoc. Every time a court decides an unsettled question of law, it would cast doubt on the validity of countless registrations. So what type of knowledge we, this is getting into the core of the case and this where it is where it gets a little bit technical because this part of section 411b talks about you put something on there knowingly and it's inaccurate and so what unicode's attorney says if you don't have the knowledge 
If you don't have the belief of a wrong thing on the application, then you don't trigger what Section 411B talks about, period. Nothing in the statute suggests that it matters one bit why you don't have that knowledge. Now, then the panel of justices started asking questions. And Justice Alito asked a really important question, and that is, were these, were these works published at all? And the response is yes, Your Honor. The publication includes conveying to an individual customer. So the answer is yes, they're published. But Justice Alito comes back and says, well, I don't know. Section 101 defines publication as copies of the work to the public by sale or transfer of ownership. Did that occur here? And the answer, yes, Your Honor. With respect to all of them, if you're speaking about these designs, all of them were published to a member of the public on that date. Justice Alito continues, though, and he says, but does that constitute publication? And then he gives an example. He says, here I have some designs. I'm showing them to you. Does that constitute publication? Now, this is where it gets murky, right? And I want you to think about this. This is the Supreme Court of the United States, literally the top court, right? And there are questions going back and forth about, is something published? And the lawyers are saying, yeah, this is published. And the justices are saying, are you, are you sure it is? Because I'm unsure. And the lawyer says, well, yeah, most of the time this would be considered published. But notice that no one has this exact answer. So the attorney for Unicolor says there are cases, right, in which courts have, courts have addressed whether a registration is invalid because someone didn't realize that giving an individual who's outside of the four corners of the company uh, means that it, it's published. So yes, showing to a member of the public, offering for publication is, uh, showing to the public is publication when you offer it for sale. Justice Sotomayor talks about, well, I understand that you wanna make this about lay people, artists and poets, but there's an argument here that your client is not an artist or poet, that your client is a patent troll. Well, I think, you know, we're talking, she was talking about copyright trolls here. Copyright trolls are a problem. And there are some situations where uh, people um, do things with copyrights and bring court cases when they shouldn't be brought. And that's a concern for the court. We're going to talk about this a little bit later with some other questions. And uh, there are some of the justices that bring up some really good rebuttals to this idea. But let me say at the outset, Unicolors is certainly not a copyright troll. Um, they uh, in no way fit the description of what companies um, who, who might be uh, called that uh, would do. So Justice Alito, who's very active in questioning, comes back and says, well, one other question, one other question. In what way could Unicolors have benefited by attempting to register all of, these, all of these designs on one application as opposed to using a separate application for each design? Now, it reduced the fee you had to pay, but could it have helped you in any other way? And the lawyer for Unicolors says, it could not have helped us in any other way, Your and I think this is really important because what they're saying is if there was uh, this error on here, it's not that there was an error made so that we got all these additional benefits. It, the only thing it did was save $65 when the error was this type of innocent error. And so when we look at, when we look at what the justices are thinking about is, well, if you, ha if you made an error that gives you all of these extra benefits, maybe that's more concerning than if you made an error that didn't give you any extra benefits, as in this case. Then the US government got up, Attorney uh, Patterson, and she started talking about what Congress intended, because remember, she's representing the government, and she said, Congress has set out a default rule to preserve the validity of copyright registrations, even if they contain some inaccurate information. Under Section 411B, such a registration remains adequate to support an infringement action unless the registrant has included inaccurate information with knowledge that it was inaccurate. 
Remember, this is kind of what this whole case is turning on. She talks about the danger. She says, the Ninth Circuit has set out an unprecedented rule that could jeopardize many thousands of copyright registrations under conditions never before thought to give rise to a risk of invalidation. And that's because the Ninth Circuit has decided that a registrant's knowledge of an inaccuracy is decided by looking solely at that registrant's factual knowledge, even if the inaccuracy at issue arises solely because of a law. And that was error. We think that in order to risk invalidation, a registrant needs to actually be aware that it's submitting an inaccuracy. And that is just as true of legal inaccuracies as it, as it is of factual ones. Well, Justice uh, Kagan chimes in for the first time and she says, well, what do you think about this constructive knowledge versus actual knowledge debate? And again, this is where things get technical. Uh, the Supreme Court deals with a lot of, uh, a lot of these technical issues. But uh, Attorney Patterson, representing the United States, says, we think it needs to be actual knowledge. You know, having reasonable grounds to know, being aware of actual facts or circumstances which are written into some of these standards is quite different than acting in deliberate disregard or recklessness or ignorance. I think that's an excellent characterization of what the standards should be. And Justice Sotomayor says, well, how about unreasonableness? And the, the, uh, the attorney says, no, Your Honor, if you honestly believe or are honestly just ignorant of the exact definition of publication or a single unit of publication in the registration, that simply being sloppy or negligent in filling out your application should not give rise to a risk of your registration being invalidated. I think that is exactly correct. I encourage you to go back to the slides. I encourage you to listen to the oral argument, which we will link to over on the Academy site and the transcript, the MP3 and the transcript. And, you know, uh, Justice Kavanaugh goes back to the brief and talks about, well, in the brief on page 21, footnote three, there was a bridge between reasonableness and knowledge. Do you still agree with that? And, and uh, Attorney Passion says, yeah, we agree with that. Um, and she wraps up the, the answer that she gives to Justice Kavanaugh with, so never before could a court invalidate your registration and not even let you get in the courthouse door because they thought you should have known the law that, is a, that it has now announced when you are filling out and checking boxes about publication, published or unpublished, derivative work, not derivative work, works for hire, not works for hire. These are not self-evident concepts to say the least. And this is one of the things that, uh, that I talk about all the time and ASMP talks about, and that is these are complex legal topics that when you fill out a copyright application, you are attesting that this means one thing and this means another thing. And what if you're wrong? What if you don't understand these complex legal topics? topics. Well, in, in what H&M is saying is that your registration should be totally thrown out and you might even be assessed attorney's fees, which is what happened in this case, which is obviously no good. Um, and we have the, just, we have the uh, attorney for the United States saying these are not self-evident concepts to say the least. I think that is exactly correct. Justice Alito says, well, what is required for a publication of a design? Remember, Justice Alito was asking, what is published? What is publication to Unicolor's attorney? And now he's asking the same questions to the U.S. attorney. And she starts with, under 101, the basic rule is that if you distribute it to the public by sale or other transfer of ownership, or distribute it to a group of persons for purposes of further distribution, that will constitute publication. What does the Copyright Office want? Well, we want registrants, we want copyright holders to be able to sue for infringement to not be turned away from the courthouse door because they got a complicated legal concept wrong, right? Even if they were proceeding in good faith, even if they were a little sloppy in filling out their application. Next up was H&M's attorney. So we had Unicolor's attorney, 
who says this, the Ninth Circuit ruling, the court below's ruling should be overturned and vacated. Uh, the, uh, the U.S. attorney says, yes, we agree with most of those arguments and that the Ninth Circuit uh, ruling is error and she's representing the Copyright Office and the U.S. government. And now we have H&M's attorney who's on the other side who says, look, if you make error, if you are inaccurate, that's a big deal. He said, when the Copyright Office registers a claim, it takes information from the application and puts it on an official certificate. That certificate confers litigation privileges, including access to statutory damages and attorney's fees. He then talks about why Unicolors is wrong. He says, in this case, Unicolors convinced the Copyright Office to register an ineligible collection by inaccurately listing a single date of publication for 31 unrelated designs that were published separately on different dates. Yet here, Unicolors insists it should retain its litigation privileges because its inaccuracies were allegedly the result of its mistaken understanding of law. And H&M's attorney, of course, says, no, well, they shouldn't be able to do that. He says there is no exception in the law. Section 411B doesn't excuse mistakes of law at all. Mistake or ignorance of law is no defense unless a statute explicitly indicates otherwise. Section 411B does not, and for good reason. It would remove the incentive for applicants to engage diligently with the copyright office. Well, then we get into a little side conversation, right? And the side conversation starts with this question from Justice Kagan, and it says, how is it that a registrant knowingly misrepresents information on the application, but does not intend to defraud? And H&M's attorney says, look, there's a big difference. Whether or not, uh, so whether or not the intent to deceive is a separate requirement has tremendous practical significance. Because if it exists as a standalone separate requirement, you have what Unicolors argued here and what they say and what they have argued respectfully in many other cases. They can say, well, even if you prove that we were subjectively aware that it was wrong, you know, we didn't think it mattered. We didn't think it was material. So we didn't have the intent to deceive. Now, I might categorize uh, that interpretation of Unicolors argument as, as not perfectly accurate. But Justice Kavanaugh builds on what Justice Kagan's question was. He says, well, I guess I'm not understanding what you just said, H&M attorney. If you know that there's a material misstatement of law in the application you're submitting to the office, how do you not have an intent to deceive? And the response is, well, you may not believe it's material. In other words, you include something that's wrong. It is material, but you don't think it's material. Now, that started a whole line of conversation about this. And uh, it, it, again, it gets a little technical and not all that interesting, but it goes to the heart of this case where we talk about if you make a mistake, does that necessarily mean you have an intent to deceive, uh, which is in many ways what H&M is saying. Well, Justice Breyer comes in and says, Fraud has a bunch of elements, but one of the elements of fraud is that if you don't know that what you're saying or doing is false, it's not fraud. And then I got to say, this was a moment where uh, this next question from Justice Breyer, if you listen to the audio, the courtroom was laughing, but it, this was a really good analogy. So Justice Breyer gives an example and he says, suppose we look around and a bird flew back there. And I say, my God, it's a scarlet tanger. And you say, no, it isn't, it's a northern oriole. I've made a mistake. You're right, you're right, okay. Now there are two reasons I might've made a mistake. One, I saw a flash of yellow, but it wasn't yellow, it was red. And you also saw it. The second reason is that we both saw the exact same thing, but I don't understand what the right use of the label is. We made a mistake of whether it's a tanger or an oriole. I made that mistake, not a mistake in what I saw. And of course, my question is, who cares? And why should the fact that we call the latter thing a question of law, but not the former thing, make any difference whatsoever to the proper solution in this case? I think that's a great example because he lays out two things here. One is, 
you and this other person both saw the same exact thing, right? You both saw the same thing and you were both correct that you saw a flash of yellow, except one person didn't know how to label it properly and the other person did. Well, that's an inaccuracy based on seeing the same thing. There's another type of inaccuracy. That inaccuracy is where one person saw a flash of yellow, but it was actually red, and the second person actually saw red, and so there was a mistake of fact, right? One is a mistake of fact. You said yellow when it was red. The other is a mistake of labeling it, and in, in this analogy, what we're talking about is a mistake of law. You attempted to understand that this was publication, but you checked the wrong box based on your good faith effort that when you saw yellow, you thought it was this, and it actually turned out to be that, right? Really good analogy for what we're looking at. And the, the courtroom laughed, and they came back to this analogy uh, uh, later on, and I think it's a good analogy. And, but just as Kavanaugh moves the questioning along and gets to what I think is really the heart of the matter here, Kavanaugh says, so your position, meaning H&M's position, is that even if someone is confused about the legal requirement of what a unit of publication is, honestly confused, truly confused, so there's no issue of lying, that when their copyright is infringed, they lose their ability to recover simply because they were honestly confused about a legal requirement and lose, in this case, some hundreds of thousands of dollars. And the question is, what sense does that make if we're in the realm of gray area? Now, H&M's attorney responds to this. And, and by the way, I think this may be the pivotal question uh, in the oral argument. So H&M responds, this statute is only triggered when it's materially inaccurate. It floods the public record with mis misinformation. Bundling, chronically bundling group registrations without paying the fees deprives the office of money to run. It chills creators. There's a lot of reasons to want to do it. So let me get to the core part of your question, which is, oh, but is it fair? What about someone who had that good faith belief? I would say two things. First, as a practical matter, diligent applicants don't face any meaningful risk of this because this is an interactive process where there are specialists at the office ready to answer questions and provide written guidance on almost every aspect of the form. Let me stop there for a second and talk about a few pieces here. I disagree significantly with H&M's attorney. And what there's a few things that he says that's that are very concerning one he says well by putting all this on one application it deprives the copyright office of fees i think that's not a good argument in general and it's specifically not a good argument in this case because the u.s attorney on behalf of the copyright office has come in and did not make that argument and if any group wanted to make the argument that it deprives the copyright office of fees it would be the Copyright Office, right? The second thing that he says is that this chills creators. And in my view, it is exactly the opposite. What chills creators is having a bar that's so high that if you check the wrong box, now the person who infringed on your work can sue you, can make you pay hundreds of thousands of dollars in attorney's fees because you checked the wrong box on something you honestly believe to be true. That chills creators. That is the danger. The danger is not that if you're a diligent applicant, you know, you won't make a mistake. That's simply untrue. It doesn't matter how diligent you are, you may truly not understand the law. And I'm now not talking just about individuals. I'm talking about lawyers. Lawyers have different opinions on what these various things mean. It just simply, this argument from H&M just, just simply doesn't, doesn't hold water for me. The last thing I want to take issue with in this answer is that he says, look, there's all these people at the Copyright Office and they're ready to tell you what to do and they're ready to write down what to do. And it is true that the Copyright Office is very good about providing what guidance they can provide but they leave it up to the applicant 
to make the core critical decisions. The Copyright Office doesn't make decisions for you in these cases. And while they might be able to give you additional information, you are the one that is signing your name to the registration. So it is uh, there in that, in that short two, three paragraph uh, answer to Justice Kavanaugh's very critical question. Uh, I think there were three or four things that I would push back on uh, as someone who works with small creators every single day. Now, for the first time, uh, Chief Justice Roberts chimes in and says, well, one of the things that Unicolor's attorney says is that this is a system that's meant for people to be able to do it themselves. You don't want to have to hire some large law firm if you think something should be copyrighted and registered for copyright. You can do that yourself. The response then from H&M says, but it's a system that relies on the honor system where the office doesn't independently verify information. It's a system where when you have constructive knowledge, that just means reasonable under the circumstances. So all the constructive knowledge rule would say is if a reasonable applicant, obviously Google is treated differently than a poet or an artist because that's an applicant with heightened knowledge, et cetera. Well, Chief Justice Roberts comes back and says, so it's a lay person who doesn't know much about copyright but knows how to write a book. It's that the, that needs to have a copyright registration. They don't have to know anything. Now, H&M's attorney says it's new or should have known. And it's very important here, Mr. Chief Justice, because the half million claims are being registered at each year. And you don't register a work, you register a claim, meaning the office relies on you as the applicant to pick the work. I think that's a bit of sidestepping the issue, right? The issue that Chief Justice Roberts is raising is that unlike patents, copyright are, uh, copyrights are designed to be registered uh, by individuals. And what, what H&M's attorney is saying, well, look, we're gonna hold Google to a different standard than we're gonna hold an author in their basement, than we're gonna hold a photographer. But I don't think that's accurate either because we're regularly involved in cases. I regularly write amicus briefs in cases where individuals, individual photographers, have uh, their registrations um, uh, examined and, and uh, uh, sent to the copyright office to see if they're inaccurate. And in court cases, it, if there is a, an inkling of an inaccuracy, lawyers now will will attempt to invalidate that registration. This doesn't just happen with these, with these large companies that should know, uh, it happens with, with everyone, with individual creators as well. Then we get back to copyright trolls and Justice Breyer talks about that. He says, well, look at your am uh, amici briefs, right? And remember, those are briefs that are friend of the court briefs. And while we wrote in support of Unicolors, there were many groups that wrote in support of, uh, of H&M here. And they said, look at your briefs. I, I mean, they're worried about copyright trolls. I'm worried about that too. That's a problem. But if you think about it, Joe Smith, who's been down in the basement for 40 years, writing the history of his dog's life, you see is, is likely to be much more able to legitimately claim that he didn't know the law, you know, on something than a copyright troll. If there's one group of people that it's gonna to be tough to make out a claim they didn't really know the law, it will be the real copyright trolls because they stay abreast of everything. What a great analysis. Really what we're saying here is the rule that Unicolors proposes doesn't help copyright trolls. In fact, it does the opposite. Because if there's any group who's going to know how to work the system and know how to make sure registrations aren't invalidated, it's going to be copyright trolls. And I think I agree with that, right? The, the, the damage here is going to fall on the individual creator and not the copyright trolls and not the big companies because they will have the ability to know exactly how to work the system. It, it falls on the small individual, small and medium sized businesses that utilize the copyright system. Well, Justice Kavanaugh says, second question, 
the policy arguments back and forth, okay. But the Solicitor General has come in on the side opposite you. What do you make of that? Well, this is, I mean, this is kind of a big question, right? Because, you know, essentially what they're saying is not only are you fighting against the other side, you're fighting against the U.S. Solicitor General who's representing the United States, who's representing the Copyright Office. And H&M's attorney talks about, you know, uh, he says, it may not feel sexy to a lot of people, copyright IP, but there are very strongly held views on questions of formality and whether it makes sense. And then he essentially, he says that from administration to administration, the views of the United States have changed dramatically. So it's not at all surprising to me that an administration and a current copyright register who's been a tremendous proponent of reducing formalities believes, you know, and then he talks about if, if, if you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. If you're an anti-formalist, everything Congress says they couldn't have possibly meant uh, that it required the formalities. Again, I'm not quite sure it was responsive to Justice Kavanaugh's point. Well, now, that was the end of, of Unicolor, of H&M's argument, and Unicolors gets the last word, remember. They get a rebuttal argument. And so uh, Unicolors' uh, attorney starts with, with this argument, uh, that there is a presumption. There was a hundred years of common law in which no court ever did what H&M is asking this court to do. He then talks about one of the questions that we didn't examine and says, these referrals to the Copyright Office. Chief Justice, he says, if you ask about the 23 referrals, those 23 referrals are going to be 23 thousands or hundreds of thousands if the rule is what H&M says it is. Now all of a sudden it will be a sport for infringers to try to find legal errors or other sorts of errors in applications, especially willful infringers who, like H&M, have no other defense. And then he addresses the issue of copyright trolls. And he says there's a couple of questions, including Justice Sotomayor's question early on about copyright trolls. I have to say, for reasons that Justice Breyer gave, this case has nothing to do with disciplining trolls. H&M has no evidence that trolls are especially likely to make mistakes on copyright applications. I agree with Justice Breyer that, if anything, they'd be less likely to make mistakes. Now, if there's a problem with baseless infringement suits, the defendants have all the tools they could possibly want, whether by showing the design is unoriginal, that the defendant did not actually copy, that the accused design is not substantially similar, and for bad faith suits, they get attorney's fees. So he's saying all the tools are there to prevent this, this thing that the other side says is a danger. Now, Unicolor's trial attorney, uh, Scott Burroughs, the law firm Doniger Burroughs, who is a great proponent of uh, creators' rights and represents a lot of photographers, um, uh, gave me a quote uh, exclusively on this, um, on this set of oral arguments because this is his case and he was one of the attorneys all the way through up to the Supreme Court. He said, we are very pleased with the way that oral arguments progress and are hopeful that the Supreme Court will issue a decision that benefits artists and makes it more difficult for copyright infringers to evade liability due to registration technicalities. Requiring a showing of actual knowledge of the technical registration error, as opposed to constructive knowledge as urged by the infringer, in order to invalidate a registration would reflect both the letter and the intent of the Pro-IP Act and ensure that copyright infringement cases are decided on the merits. Well, I think that is, that is a great encapsulation of these oral arguments. And uh, as someone who, who wrote an amicus brief that was joined by all the groups that we talked about uh, fighting for the rights of creators, I absolutely agree with what Scott said here. Uh, and I thought the oral arguments were positive uh, for unicolors. And I am anxiously awaiting, uh, I'm anxiously awaiting the judgment of the Supreme Court on this. Now, this was a deeper dive than we usually make into cases, but because of the importance and because it was in front of the U.S. Supreme Court and because it just happened last week, I thought we should really take a look here. As we've discussed, 
um, in each of these Focus on the Law uh, shows, I'm going to take some time at the end and answer some quick one to two minute answers on some legal, uh, legal quick hits that, uh, that will make a difference. And these questions are ones that you can refer to. Now, we don't get to go super deep here, but at the uh, ASMP Academy, you'll be able to find courses on many of these topics. And I think that those will give you the in-depth discussion. But let's see if we can just do two or three of these legal quick hits. So what is an amicus brief? Well, we already talked about this a little bit today, right? So an amicus brief is a friend of the court brief. And when we say it's a friend of the court brief, what we mean is it's written by organizations and supported by organizations who are not parties to the case. They're not the litigant. They're not the, the, the petitioner. What they are are groups like ASMP who want to help the justices understand that the rulings they're going to make are, are affect real people and can have major consequences. And so when you read the brief that I wrote in a case like Unicolors or in a case like uh, Allen versus Cooper or many of the other cases that we've written about, uh, amicus briefs are designed to make sure that all the issues are known, uh, all the issues are known to the judges and the justices. And it's not just at the US Supreme Court. Uh, uh, I've written amicus briefs in the appellate courts and even some state courts uh, when issues related to um, uh, visual creators and photographers and copyright come up. Uh, you can find all of our amicus briefs over at asmp.org if you'd like to read them further. How are LLCs taxed? Now, let me begin by saying I am not an accountant and I am not a tax attorney. But I am a small business owner. Uh, before I joined ASMP full time, I uh, owned my law firm with a number of employees. And even before I went to law school, I owned photography businesses, a few different ones when I was a professional photographer. And, and so I really recommend you work with your CPA or your tax attorney or your accountant to, to get the exact answer on how this is going to affect you. But let me speak generally. LLCs, as you have heard me probably say a hundred times, are an exceptionally wonderful way, uh, an exceptional way to set up your business. And one of the reasons that it's exceptional is that LLCs are considered disregarded entities by the IRS. Well, that sounds bad. The IRS doesn't recognize LLCs, but it actually turns out to be positive because LLCs can be taxed in whatever way the LLC owner wishes. Now, if you don't do anything, LLCs are taxed like you're a sole proprietor if you're a single member LLC, or taxed like you're a partnership if you're a multi-member LLC. But by filling out a form, by filling out one form when you set up your LLC, you can say to the IRS, I want to be taxed, I want my LLC to be taxed like an S-Corp or even if you wanted to, like a C-Corp, right? And so LLCs are not recognized by the IRS. The benefit there is it gives you ultimate flexibility. You can choose to be taxed like a sole proprietorship or a partnership, or even like a corporation, and especially like an S-Corporation. Now, as to how you want to be taxed, that's a decision that you have to make based on your circumstances and speaking with your advisors. But that, in a nutshell, is how LLCs are taxed. Why are copyright registration, uh, why is copyright registration so important? Now, I could talk for days about why copyright registration is critical. And if you go to the ASMP Academy under the core copyright curriculum, the second course in that uh, five course curriculum is a walkthrough of copyright registration. And the reason copyright registration is so important is that it protects your rights in the future. If you register your copyright, you register your copyright before the work is infringed, then you're eligible for a whole bunch of benefits. 
One of them are called statutory damages. And statutory damages are, are amounts that you can be awarded if an infringer then infringes on your work and you then bring a suit against them. But let's say someone infringes and they didn't make a lot of money and it's a pretty small infringement and it might not be worth going to court over because you'd pay more in legal fees than you would, uh, than you would recover. And that's where statutory damages come in. Even if there are no actual damages, you have the option to get up to uh, $30,000 per infringement or in a willful infringement situation up to $150,000 per infringement. But you don't get statutory damages if you wait to register your work till after you find the infringement. So if you wait and then you see someone infringed you and then you're like, oh, I better go register right now, you can still register, but you won't be eligible for statutory damages. That makes it a lot harder to find a lawyer and it makes the whole process more difficult. Another benefit to registering your work before an infringement is that you're eligible to get attorney's fees from the other side. You're eligible to, to recover what, what you paid to your attorney for that. That's a huge deal. There's a number of other reasons why copyright registration is critical. But what I really want to impress upon you now is that the number one reason that copyright registration is critical is that if you, if you register your works before the infringement takes place, you are, you're eligible for a number of benefits that can make the difference between being able to hold an infringer to account or looking at the infringement and saying, well, I, I really can't do anything about that. So it makes all the difference in the world. I want to thank you all for joining us for episode two as we did a deep dive into Unicolors versus H&M and we answered a few more legal quick hit questions. Remember, you can always go to academy.asmp.org and view all our different shows. We have uh, four different ones right now, plus all of our classes. We have so many hours of, of education. We have a document library with more than 20 brand new uh, uh, up-to-date documents uh, like talent releases and social media licensing releases and assignment releases and terms and conditions and copyright agreements. And we got everything there totally updated. Uh, go check out the ASMP Academy. Thank you again uh, for, uh, for listening to and viewing this second episode of Focus on the Law. We'll be back in just a couple of weeks taking another dive into a major case, looking at some things in the news and answering some more legal quick hit questions. For ASMP and the ASMP Academy, I'm Thomas Madry. Thank you so much. We'll talk soon.